This is Dr. Nell providing you with another PowerPoint podcast, and this podcast will be uh, covering the IV and local anesthetics. Uh, Dr. Applegate will lecture you on uh, the anesthetics section of the course, and he will divide his lectures into three sections, um, inhaled gases, intravenous uh, anesthetics, and lastly, local anesthetics. We'll just cover two of the three sections that he's going to cover um, which is the IV and IV anesthetics and the local anesthetics. Um, again, this is just simply for your preview for exam purposes preparation, and I certainly do hope that you will also um, attend his lectures because I think he's an outstanding clinician and he has some uh, some good information that he wants to share with you. So let's go ahead and get started with the intravenous anti I'm sorry intravenous anesthetics. So. You have several on your list, um, the first of which is propofol. Um, keep in mind this phrase right here, propofol, uh, quote unquote, wrap it on and wrap it off. So this drug, it's a great drug that has uh, very, very quick effects, but then when you stop it, the nice thing about it is that its effects wear, wears off uh, pretty quickly. The mechanism of action is that it's a GABA-A uh, receptor. Uh, it acts on the GABA-A receptor complex to maintain an open channel, um, resulting in hyperpolarization. And as a consequence of that, you have a reduction in the transmission of, uh, of neural impulses. Some of the systemic effects are shown here with regards to the central nervous system. It does help to reduce the blood flow to the brain, so therefore you have a net reduction in your increase or you have a net reduction in your intracranial pressure. Um, other CNS effects is that it does pr produce a state of unconsciousness as well as amnesia. One thing to keep in mind is that this drug does not offer any, any relief from pain, so it does not have any analgesia effects at all. Next is the cardiovascular effects. One of the um, probably really significant side effects of propofol is that it can cause fairly significant hypotension. So oftentimes before starting propofol, uh, we'll give the patients a, a bolus of IV fluids just to make sure they're adequately hydrated so they're able to maintain their blood pressure. It does have effect on both the um, uh, peripheral arteries as well as, as veins, and it um, pr uh, promotes dilatation. The interesting thing about propofol is that it actually dampens the barrier, barrel receptor uh, response, uh, so that you know normally uh, 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 the barrel receptor response will adjust uh, to your changes in your hemodynamics, but when you have propofol on board, you don't have this uh, uh, correction mechanism. With regards to the respiratory system, it does cause pretty quick uh, apnea. Um, but the other one nice thing with regards to its respiratory effect is that it does decrease the upper airway reflexes. So when we do uh, upper endoscopies or bronchoscopies where we're working in the area of the pharynx and the upper airway, and just by merely stimulating it, you can cause a, a, a reflexive uh, choking or gagging. When you use propofol, this really helps to diminish that response. So it's an advantage to use propofol in in uh, procedures where you're anticipating manipulation of the uh, upper airway. The next drug uh, is our barbiturates, and our pr uh, prototypical drug for that is thiopental. Mechanism of action is very similar to propofol, so uh, review your mechanism for propofol. Uh, similarly to propofol, thiopental also uh, has a, an associated reduction in blood flow to the brain and uh, also it reduces the intracranial pressure. It also um, results in a state of unconsciousness as well as amnesia. And like propofol, it does not have any analgesic uh, effects. With regards to the cardiovascular system, thiopenta does not have as dramatic of a reduction in blood pressure, just a, a, a mild reduction. It does cause peripheral vasodilatation. And it does also have a, has a negative ionotropic effect on the heart, so it, it reduces the, the ionotrope effect. And unlike uh, propofol, 
and there's no dampening of the uh, baroreceptor response with thiopental. Thal thalpental or barbiturates can cause apnea, uh, but unlike propofol, it does not have any uh, effect, or effect on dampening the upper airway reflexes. Next is benzodiazepine. I know that we've had benzodiazepine in several other portions of the course, uh, so you should be very well familiar with this. Um, the prototypical drug we'll uh, choose this time is midazolam, is a type of benzodiazepine. The mechanism of action is, is similar to propofol as we uh, list there. Um, again, the antidote for patients who overdose on benzodiazepine, or if you want to reverse a benzodiazepine agent, it's, uh, it's, it's by using flumazenil. Uh, its effect on uh, blood flow to the brain is pretty minor, um, and so the, 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 its effect on reducing intracranial pressure is probably not as uh, dramatic as with propofol or thiopental. Similarly to thiopental as well as propofol, it does have a effect of causing unconsciousness, amnesia, but it does not have any analgesic effects. Um, it has pretty minimal effects on the blood pressure, has a uh, pretty minimal to no effect on ionotrope for the heart, and similar to thiopental, it does not uh, have any uh, dampening effects on the baroreceptor. Um, it's, it's relatively safe when it comes to respiratory issues. It does cause a, a transient apnea when you initially first give it, and it may cause a mild respiratory distress, but overall a fairly safe drug. The last drug um, on our list of intravenous uh, um, anesthetics is ketamine. Ketamine is uh, unique compared to the other three propofol barbiturates or uh, benzodiazepine. And the first unique feature is that it, it works by a different mechanism. It blocks the, the uh, N-methyl-D-aspartate uh, type glutamate receptors and, uh, versus the other three, which acts through the GABA-A receptor. And, it, it, and the, the, one of the key differences between this and the other three is that it actually increases the blood flow to the brain, and that results in an increase in your intracranial pressure. Um, in terms of clinically, what do you see? The patients looks like they're in a catatonic state, and so they look. They, oftentimes, their eyes will remain wide open during the procedure or sedation, and they look like they just saw a ghost. And so, so this is what we call the quote unquote the blank stare effect. It uh, it does have amnesia uh, effects, and very unique to ketamine compared to the other three. Again is that it has analgesia effects, so it does have some properties of helping to reduce uh, pain. And so the key term that anesthesiologists use in describing ketamine is that it provides a dissociative uh, anesthesia. When patients wake up from this drug, uh, they have what's called an emergence phenomenon, and they, they, they feel like they're very disoriented. Some of them may be hallucinating, and some of them may have very uh, vivid, oftentimes unpleasant uh, dreams. So uh, when we see these uh, reaction, uh, many of these patients can act like they're, they're, going, uh, they're going crazy. But after a while, after it wears down, then the patients are actually absolutely fine. Now, unlike the other three drugs, uh, ketamine actually has a central stimulatory effect on the sympathetic system. So it results in and an increase in your blood pressure, heart rate, as well as your uh, cardiac output. But because of that, keep in mind that it, also, it it's actually is a burden on the cardiac workload. So if you have a patient with ischemic heart disease, uh, you need to be careful or choose a different agent uh, altogether and not use ketamine. Um, and one of the very, very unique features is that with regards to the respiratory system, it actually does not uh, have any significant respiratory depression compared to the other three IV anesthetics on this list. And in fact, it's actually good for patients with asthma or patients at risk for bronchospasm because it does have a bronchodilatory effect. So uh, again, these are your four uh, IV anesthetic drugs. Uh, here, we just show you an example of the uh, NMDA receptor. And so and the MM, and so the NMDA receptor is a glutamate receptor. You can see there there's a site for the glutamate binding. Um, and you have other sites for other 
uh, other cofactors. Uh, here, uh, when you have um, uh, ketamine, ketamine actually binds on two sites of this um, NMDA receptor. It has its own separate uh, allosteric uh, site uh, away from the glutamate, but it can it can actually also block the the uh, the, the channel itself, and so and so both of these actions uh, blocks the flow of uh, of um, of electrolytes uh, through the channel and subsequently reduce the transmission of the uh, uh, of the uh, neural signals. You've seen this figure several times before, but this is just a figure of the GABA A uh, receptor uh, uh, chloride channel complex. You can see that uh, on one side you have the barbiturate binding site, on the opposite side you have, or the opposite domain, uh, you have a benzodiazepine uh, binding site, and then you have other ligands that can bind other uh, other parts. And again, this is. The benzodiazepine site is where the uh, flumazenil, um, flumaz flumazenil operates. So what are some of the side effects uh, of these uh, IV anesthetics? So this is pretty much the exact uh, same table that we um, put together earlier, but I highlighted the side effects in red. So with propofol, you're going to be concerned about a significant reduction in blood pressure, and like I said, that's why we, we generally would tank up these patients with IV fluids before the sedation. Uh, and again, you got to be careful about apnea uh, and uh, be ready to provide airway support for these patients. Uh, when it comes to barbiturates, you do have a... A modest reduction in your blood pressure, but not as bad as a propofol. You also may uh, encounter apnea uh, in patients who are who you're giving barbiturates or thiopental to. And then finally, uh, patients who already have porphyria, you may exacerbate their porphyria symptoms if you give them uh, barbiturates or thiopental. And so you probably want to stay away from this drug for patients with a history of porphyria. Benzodiazepine. Uh, again, you have the transient uh, apnea and mild respiratory uh, depression. But overall, if you use it appropriately at the appropriate doses, uh, you should be fine with uh, benzodiazepine. Lastly, with ketamine, you have an increase in the intracranial pressure. Patients look like they're in a catatonic state. And when you have this emergence phenomenon that I didn't highlight here, uh, but uh, you know they can be very disoriented and hallucinating when they uh, when they uh, come out of the anesthesia. Um, they have an elevation in blood pressure, heart rate, and again, increase in cardiac workload. But the respiratory profile is actually pretty favorable for, for uh, ketamine. Um, in terms of the uses of these drugs, Propofol, as we said again, is uh, a what's called a rapid-on, rapid-off drug. In other words, it takes effects quickly and it wears off quickly once you stop the medication. Uh, we've been using it more and more over the last five to seven years, uh, again, because it's such a rapid-on, rapid-off drug. We use it for uh, anesthesia, induction of anesthesia, and you can actually also use it for maintenance of anesthesia. And typically, these are, these are procedures that may last from anywhere from one, one and a half to two hours. You have a rapid sedation as well, along with a rapid recovery. Um, you can use it in situations where you only require anesthesia for short duration, so it's great for uh, endoscopies that we do in the lab. Um, again, upper airway procedures because it dampens the upper airway reflexes, uh, and so the patient overall is generally more comfortable. And then if you have a patient with increased intracranial pressure, you can use propofol if you need to sedate because it, it will help to reduce the intracranial pressure. Barbiturates, um, you want to use it for sh uh, sh uh, shorter procedures. You, all, you can use it for the induction or initiation of anesthesia. If a patient has refractory seizures, barbiturates such as thiopental may help. And similar to propofol, it does also help to reduce your intracranial pressure. Benzodiazepines uh, used for very short procedures. So if you uh, do something like um, uh, a, a lumbar puncture on a child, uh, you can use a benzodiazepine. 
Uh, similar to the other two drugs, you can use it to induce anesthesia. Many patients, including children who are anxious uh, before or after a procedure, uh, they respond well to uh, benzodiazepine to help reduce their anxiety. And if you want patients not to remember their uh, their procedure, then you can uh, add on a benzodiazepine to other agents that you're using. But also keep in mind that the propofol and barbiturates also has an amnesia effect. Um, ketamine, um, it's good for patients who need anesthesia but who are at risk for having hypotension or bronchospasm or asthma. Uh, we use it uh, a fair amount in our pediatrics uh, sedations for um, endoscopies. Generally, ketamine, we generally try to keep the procedure around less than an hour. And uh, like the other agents, you can also use it as an adjunct to uh, anesthesia induction. So that was the uh, intravenous anesthetics. Now we'll go ahead and go on to the local anesthetics. So I uh, want to start off by the mechanism of action because all, pretty much all the uh, local anesthetics works by, this, uh, by a, the same mechanism. And that mechanism uh, here so hopefully this is a memory tool for you. So the mechanism is a voltage-gated sodium channel, right? So since all of the, uh, or most if not all, of the local anesthetics end in some type of cane, so if you think about a hurricane with lightning bolts and, you know, you have a salt sprinkled onto your, uh, into the rain that comes with a hurricane, then hopefully you remember it, right? So this is your lightning bolt, this is your hurricane, and this is your sodium channel. Okay, so hopefully that will help at least uh, some of you. All right, so this is a schematic of it. So in the resting state, the, uh, um, uh, the, um, the channel is uh, closed, so none of the ions can go through. But when you have a neuronic stimulation, the, uh, the, uh, the channel changes conformation and you have an initial influx of, uh, of ions and then eventually uh, the entire channel opens up. Now once the, uh, stimula the stimulation uh, um, source is subsided, the first thing that happens actually is that you have this um, domain that is called a ball and chain domain. It actually swings over and begins to close the gate. And then it's only after this ball plugs in to that uh, channel that the entire channel then returns to its initial confirmation in the uh, resting state. Uh, so again, this is the uh, voltage-gated uh, ion or voltage-gated sodium channel. So be before we actually dive into the drugs, I just want to sort of give you my, my simplistic uh, treatment of the types of anesthesia. And I generally categorize it into two types uh, one is uh, regional anesthesia, and the second one is uh, infiltrative or infiltration an uh, anesthesia. So let's go over some examples of regional anesthesia. So the first one is epi epidural. So many, if not most of you, have probably heard of epidurals for, uh, for, uh, for moms who are giving birth. Uh, you can also use epidural as a uh, regional anesthesia for C-sections. It can also be used as an adjunctive to general anesthesia. And patients who are post-procedure or post-surgery who have very localized pain can use uh, uh, epidural for patient-controlled uh, analgesia. Um, so sorry, just to step back a minute, regional an an anesthesia means uh, that we are trying to uh, provide anesthesia for a specific region of the body, and the patient uh, can actually stay awake uh, and, uh, and, and, and emotionally or uh, consciously um, responsive in this, this type of anesthesia, right? So uh, that's a, a huge advantage, particularly uh, for situations where you cannot uh, afford or you not, do not want to fully sedate the uh, patient. You can also have spinal anesthesia, and we'll have a slide on this on the next slide. But this is good for uh, things like lower limb repair, hernia repair, and again, uh, cesarean sections. And then lastly, another uh, third example of a regional anesthesia is peripheral nerve blocks. Uh, and many of these are patients with peripheral pain syndrome. So for example, I uh, used to take care of a child who had chronic pancreatitis and really had really significant pain. 
and really unresponsive to any of the opioids and traditional intravenous uh, analgesics. So we ended up doing a uh, celiac nerve block uh, where uh, the interventional radiologist just uh, went in and put in some uh, anesthetics in the celiac uh, plexus. And that actually was the thing that was most effective for this particular uh, child. The second type of anesthesia is a, is a much more uh, localized type of anesthesia, and it's, it's in infiltration. And examples of infiltrative anesthesia are when you uh, have to uh, uh, wash or um, suture wounds, and certainly all, all of us who've had dental procedures and required local uh, anesthetics, uh, that's the other place where it's commonly used. So this is an example here of infiltrative anesthesia, so this patient has a uh, has a, a fairly sizable wound there, and and to, and before you suture it, you want to give uh, or infiltrate uh, around the wound area, just to numb it up a little bit, so that the patient can be comfortable when you close up the wound. And then certainly when we go to the dentist, the dentist will will uh, give us the uh, very localized infiltration, uh, uh, you know, so that we're comfortable during the uh, dental procedures. Uh, this is an example of regional anesthesia. This is a, a, an epidural, and so uh, usually in an epidural, uh, you end up with a catheter that, uh, that the tip of which ends up in your epidural space. And so you can see here how the procedure is done. Uh, the needle is actually passed through the superficial layers of the uh, skin and fat layer. It goes through the uh, ligaments. Uh, and you, you, you go, you, your goal is to go into the epidural uh, space here. Obviously, you do not want to go through the, the dura layer here because then you risk uh, uh, injuring the spinal cord. So the catheter that you see out here, its tip in an ideal situation will end up in the, uh, in the epidural, uh, epidural space. And an anesthesiologist will go ahead and, and place this prior to the uh, procedure or, um, or childbirth. This slide here shows you the difference between a epidural, which is here, and an epidural, again, we want to stay in the epidural space, whereas in a spinal anesthesia, we actually, it has to be done much lower uh, than we do epidurals, because as you can see, if you do it high, you really, really run the risk of injuring the spinal cord. So if you do it low, uh, the spinal cord has terminated up, uh, pre you know, up here previously already. So you go through and you go into the um, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the the CSF uh, space there, and uh, you you inject your um, your anesthetics uh, over there. Okay, so that was just a a sampling of of uh, areas where we can put uh, local anesthesia. So we'll go ahead and dive into the drugs. And so the first drug is lidocaine. You probably have heard about this. Its side effect includes um, what's called transient neurologic symptoms. So this is a syndrome where you have transient pain or dysasthenia. So this is, I'm sorry, dysesthesia. Dysesthesia is when you have a sensation that is uncomfortable, that feels like you're burning, you're itchy, you're on pins and needles, and, and for some patients they report feeling like they have an electric shock. And a small number of patients also feel that the area is also feels very wet. So what are some of the uses of lidocaine? Well, you can use it for local infiltrative blocks if you're going to suture up a wound. Uh, you can also use it for peripheral nerve blocks uh, for, uh, for, for patients with uh, um, regional uh, pain syndromes. And then you can also use it for your epidural or spinal anesthesia, like we do in, uh, in, in, in moms who are about to give birth. Next is uh, bubicane. Uh, bubicane is uh, toxic effects includes a cardiotoxicity. Cardiotoxicity can happen with any of the lo any of the local anesthetic agents. However, uh, bubicane actually has an increased incidence of it, and you may see bradycardia as well as hypotension. Bubicane is good for infiltrative blocks, peripheral nerve blocks, as well as epidural and spinal anesthesia. Benzocaine. Uh, side effects of benzocaine is met hemoglobinemia. So you all know how to treat met hemoglobinemia from our toxicology lecture. Um, bubicaine, I'm sorry, benzocaine, the main use of that will be as a topical anesthetic. So we find it a lot in uh, teething gels that we give to many of our babies as well. Uh, adults take that sometimes also.
Procaine uh, side effects includes uh, an allergic reaction. The allergic reaction is mediated by a PABA because uh, procaine actually is metabolized to para-aminobenzoic acid or PABA, and it's the PABA that uh, promotes the allergic uh, response. Propcaine is used in infiltrative blocks, and it can also be used in local and regional anesthesia. Tetracaine, main use for that is in spinal anesthesia. And cocaine, uh, uh, this is where cocaine actually has a, um, um, a medical indication, is uh, side effects of cocaine patients are euphoric. They may become restless and have seizures and tremors in an overdose situation. They also can be tachycardic and uh, they can have arrhythmias. Uh, limited use of cocaine include a topical anesthesia on the mucosal surface. So, for example, if you're doing an ENT procedure, and particularly uh, the particular use of it is that if you have some type of bleed that you require a vasoconstriction to stop the bleed, uh, cocaine can, all, can be very, very helpful in those situations. And so unlike most of the other um, um, uh, local anesthetic drugs, uh, cocaine is actually pretty much the only one that has uh, a vasoconstrictive effect and, uh, uh, and helps to reduce, uh, reduce bleeding. Now speaking of uh, vasco, vasoconstrictive uh, effects, uh, epinephrine uh, is also a vasoconstrictor that is often used in conjunction with local anesthetics. Now you want to completely disregard there because that's just a bad cut and paste job. So that actually uh, should be uh, should be empty, or you can actually fill it with uh, with uh, any of your other uh, epinephrine side effects that we talked about before. So uh, tachycardia, a high a high blood pressure, and if you give uh, too much epinephrine in the periphery. Uh, you can actually vasoconstrict so much that patients have lost fingers and toes. And so you do want to be careful about using epinephrine uh, in the distal uh, extremities. And usually, um, uh, like we talked about in the cardiovascular section, when you have to infuse epinephrine in a drip, it has to be with the central line to try to minimize the um, possibility of uh, uh, peripheral vaso vasoconstriction. So, but if you do have a situation where you're infiltrating in an area and you do want that area to be constricted, uh, you do add epinephrine to your mixture of the local anesthetics. So it does have uh, very good uh, vasoconstriction effects. Uh, it helps to reduce bleeding. Uh, it also helps to keep your drug in the local area so that you have a longer effect from that, uh, from that drug. So again, uh, you prolong your anesthesia effects. And that is the ending of our podcast for uh, the IV anesthetics as well as the local anesthetics. And I leave you with this picture so that hopefully you will remember the mechanism uh, of action of the, top, the, the uh, local anesthetics. We will see you in class.